So hello students of history. So today we are going to be examining the colonization of North America. And specifically we're going to be focusing on English colonies and the development of the English colony all the way from sort of the adventuring days of Sir Walter Raleigh and uh, Sir Francis Drake. Sir Humphrey Gilbert, these kinds of pirate uh, gentlemen uh, settlers that uh, come to the wilderness and try to found colonies, and we'll see the development of North American colonies from sort of religious experiments and the uh, the New England colonies of the Puritans, which we really looked at in our last lecture. That really will not be the focus of this, but we'll examine this. Uh, we will look at at the development of proprietary colonies and sort of how. Uh, the, the crown in England gave uh, land grants to various individuals or groups of individuals, the development of the joint stock company, and how uh, the burdens of colonization were shared among groups of proprietors, and how the profits were shared among various groups of proprietors. We'll examine the development of colonial economies and sort of social experiments such as uh, Pennsylvania as well as the colony of Georgia in the South, which is really the most radical of them all under Oglethorpe. And uh, throughout this time, I just want to, to not to ask you to dwell on sort of the myopic details of each of these colonies, but just sort of see the grander arc here of colonial development of uh, English colonies and colonization throughout uh, the, the period from 1600 to, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, the mid-1700s. Uh, and we want to see how the economy, the sort of the beliefs of, of uh, mercantilist uh, uh, economics, as well as the development uh, from a uh, from those from a voluntary uh, a system of, of coming for laboring in the colonies, uh, to land grant systems, to uh, indentured servitude, to slavery. So all of these features of, uh, of early colonization we will be examining and also we will begin to look at uh, you know, how this turns into empire and that from a very loosely privatized system uh, of colonization to one of, uh, of being much more under direct royal control and parliamentary regulation. Uh, so uh, I look forward to going through this with you. I'll see you in a moment in the slides. So here we're going to begin looking at the colonization of North America. And specifically, we're going to be looking at the English colonies that will become the United States after the Great American Revolution. So, as I've hinted at in, in a few lectures past, that there is a difference, and it's more than a subtle difference between colonization and empire. Colonization really begins as uh, a private effort uh, or venture of some uh, a few gentlemen who come out into the wilderness and attempt to uh, set up some colonies and they were uh, uh, not very successful in this and uh, it, it then transforms into groups uh, or groups of individual you know proprietors who are going to begin to accept land grants or to, to uh, uh, take vent you know ventures upon these areas of the new world that will become a colony and the goal of course is to become profitable and there's going to be other groups of people such as the Puritans who come over and are motivated largely by uh, religious zeal to establish colonies and, and there's going to be all kinds of motivations but eventually it will come under crown control that there will become a governor and there and uh, and the powers of England Parliament, the king, will, will come in and they will begin to create spheres of influence uh, to where it is beneficial not only just for groups of people or particular proprietors, um, but it will become a royal venture and it will become uh, empire then. And, uh, and where the, the, uh, the king and, the, and, uh, and England itself will have vested interests in the success of these particular uh, places in particular uh, formerly business ventures, which is really a more accurate way to think of colonies that uh, in most cases, other than some of the, uh, the Puritan groups, um, the, the goal is really a business venture here. It is, uh, it is to make money. It is to uh, be economically successful. And so let us begin to have a look at this. 
So as I said here, there are uh, different groups uh, and, and, uh, and different individuals who came to the United States. And the earliest two adventurers, if you will, are, are uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Sir Walter Raleigh. Um, and uh, these, these, uh, these are the earliest colonies that are English colonies founded in, in North America. And Gilbert's going to found a colony in Newfoundland. And this goes along the academic theory in England that, uh, that the same latitude enjoyed by England would be in Newfoundland. And therefore, the climate would be the same. And of course, the Canadian winters in Newfoundland are very harsh. And the climate is nothing like England. So these failed quite quickly. There was efforts to set up colonies in uh, in, in Maine initially, under the um, uh, the the original uh, settlers who would become who would move into uh, the Chesapeake Bay would would of course start in Maine and fail because of the harsh winters up there as well. So uh, this theory is uh, shot to pieces after uh, after several failed attempts at colonization because of the harsh climates. Um, we then see groups of individuals begin to form, and we call these joint stock companies, or sometimes these are referred to as corporate colonies. And rather than one person, such as Sir Walter Raleigh, who founds Roanoke Island, and uh, the, the settlement fails because of the Spanish Armada in, in, uh, in 1588, and the colony is not able to be resupplied and they are not able to grow their own food and and when uh, raleigh is able to send uh send supplies and help to the colony the only thing that is left on on the island of where they were settling is is the word croatoan which is uh carved into a tree there on on the, on on roanoke island and it was an adjoining island and and uh the uh exp the saving or, or the party who had come to save the day uh, goes and tries to find on on uh, the settlers on Croatoan Island, and there's nothing there. So it's it's kind of a huge mystery of what really happens with the the founding of Roanoke Colony, but it is of course a failure. But then, of course, Sir Walter Raleigh or whoever decides to try to found these colonies by themselves, they take enormous risk because not only uh, are all 100% of the profits potentially theirs if the colony does well. Um, but also that there is, uh, they are 100% liable if the colony fails. They lose 100% of their money. So therefore these things, uh, joint stock companies, uh, come into existence. And this is where a group of individuals, rather than just a single proprietor, pool their money to found a colony. And therefore they share risk. Um, that they are not, uh, they are not 100% liable for the failure, but also that they don't reap 100% of the profits in the event that uh, the colony is successful. So if you invest $100 into, uh, let's say, a colony costs $1,000, so you get 10 people to invest $100 rather than one investing 1000 So if the colony fails, you only have lost $100 instead of uh, you losing $1,000. But also, if it makes $10,000, of course, everyone is going to get $1,000 in uh, return. So huge returns for your $100 investment. Now... This could be advantageous, but uh, the, the thought in colonization was everyone was going to be like the Spanish, that they wanted to find uh, huge deposits of gold and silver and jewels, uh, but this just does not exist in the, uh, really anywhere outside of South America and, and, uh, and the Yucatan. So as much as, as uh, other nations would search to find um, the mythical El Dorado uh, and, and, uh, and colonies rich in bullion. Uh, really, it was sugar that was the next most profitable thing. So the, the islands of the West Indies uh, were, were highly profitable ventures. And this, this was because of cash crop, because of the sugar. And it is the by far the most valuable crop in, in the New World. Uh, tobacco pales in comparison to this. It is uh, only one-tenth the value of what sugar is. Um, 
so the colonies that come to form the United States, it's kind of strange that these, uh, it was thought of that these places were just vast wildernesses uh, with very little to offer. Uh, and and uh, eventually only really, the only thing that is profitable out of them is, is uh, tobacco to a large scale. But, but uh, nevertheless, we see here that people uh, and private individuals are uh, very interested and uh, try time and time again to uh, to move into the new world uh, and and to have successful business ventures through colonization. Um, that this is a, a risky kind of uh, venture, but nevertheless, there are plenty of people who are willing to give it a try. And this is, I would again stress to you, not something that is done by England. England does not give these people money. Uh, they often give them, uh, there are sometimes they will get a land grant or they will get a charter in order to uh, to to found a, a certain colony or the, the, the right to live there and, and control the the lands uh, but and make their own laws to some degree but um, it is a private venture here colonization is a private venture not a uh, not a crown led venture and here you can see some of the other colonies or some of these these uh, uh, these early settlements here, and this is uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert's route uh, to the New World, and you can see again following the same latitude here as England to settle in uh, in Newfoundland and eventually Nova Scotia. And the same thing here, we see uh, Sir, Sir Walter Raleigh founding uh, in the Outer Banks here in uh, in Roanoke Island uh, off uh, the present day of the Carolinas. And here you can see, as we've talked about with uh, the Puritan colonies, and we call these the New England colonies in academic parlance, but in the, the time period, these would have been known as the Puritan colonies. And we begin as a hallmark of these colonies was that they were not set up for profit. These are places that were set up for religious freedom. And so they're, therefore, they don't pursue for the first uh, several decades of their existence, any kind of, of really profitable cash crop agriculture. Um, it's really subsistence farming, uh, and it's much more focused upon uh, setting up a, a you know a godly uh, a godly city on a hill. Is is really what uh, these New England Puritan colonies try to, and then and it doesn't it uh, it doesn't work, of course. Um, but nevertheless, uh, try they did, and we began to see almost immediately the fracturing of these colonies uh, within. Uh, the first generation, even that uh, you, there's theological disagreements among uh, these colonists, and uh, the Puritans began to set up their own uh, their own new uh, areas of influence where they could practice their religion as they felt that they could. Uh, Rhode Island, Delaware, um, Massachusetts Bay, you know these sorts of things that uh, uh, that they would break apart from the original settlers at Plymouth. So let us turn to the first colony that was established, and this is the colony of Virginia, and specifically Jamestown. And of course, they, uh, following the traditional academic theory as we have, have uh, discussed, uh, they originally set up in Maine because they, it was at a similar latitude uh, with England, and they thought that this would be the same climate. It indeed was not. So their second attempt in 1607 um, was to set up the colony of Jamestown, Virginia. And the Virginia Company of London, uh, named after the Virgin Queen, Queen Elizabeth, who had uh, died uh, very shortly before this, um, that they had received a land grant uh, in, uh, to, to set up a colony in, uh, in the, this new world, this, new, this sphere of influence of England. And they began by selecting uh, a group of, of people who were going to go over and to, to found this new settlement of colony, or this new colony. And these, in many cases, uh, were, were gentlemen who went over and did not expect to be toiling in the soils and, and having to work their own farms, that they very much conceived themselves to be much more like a military settlement where supplies would be brought in and there would be, uh, there would be working class individuals who would be sent over to do the farming and uh, that this would be sort of a, a colony of, of, of gentlemen. And this definitely proved to not be the case in, uh, in 
they nearly starved to death on their in their first winter, and it was only because of the charity and benevolence of uh, the the local Native Americans um, that uh, that these people did not die in their first year and second year and third year uh, in in the colonies there. Um, but they quite quickly had to realize that they had to adopt uh, new strategies. And, and instead of uh, within those first few years of trying to create a system of subsistence farming, they wasted enormous amounts of time trying to find gold as well as searching for the fabled Northwest Passage, right? This, this route to China um, that no one ever ultimately found. So there were in the first a few years of the colonies, really the first decade entirely, that there was just massive mortality rates. You know, half the people, more than half the people, uh, die in in uh, these uh, these first years, and it comes from a. Uh, a combination of factors, and academics will debate these over, but uh, uh, certainly famine is thought of as the more traditional view, and then the second view of why they died so quickly was from typhoid fever and dysentery because, well, they had uh, their sewage right in their, there in their uh, local area, um, so this uh, contaminated their water supply, and therefore it caused a uh, uh, very high mortality rates. But nevertheless, we see a combination here of no food um, and, uh, and high sickness, or, uh, you know, high, high, uh, high sickness rates, which equals high death rates. Um, so we, we see um, really very, very little success in the first years of the colony of Virginia. So it might be asked, why did um, the Native Americans help these people? Well, these Settlers in Jamestown were not the sort of first ones uh, to, to ever come to this area. And the French, uh, as well as the English and uh, in, in other areas, and the Dutch had come into the New World and they traded with uh, the Native Americans. For largely for furs, because uh, especially beaver hats, uh, mink hats, uh, and, and linings in, in uh, jackets and these types of things were very high. Uh, 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 very high class, very expensive items in the new world or in the old world. Um, so therefore, uh, Native Americans who uh, were very skilled at uh, uh, trappers and, and fur traders themselves were, were able to make um, large amounts of of money from well, not really money, but uh, uh, they were able to make lucrative trade deals with Europeans for the furs that they trapped, and therefore um, the uh, Powhatan uh, Confederation here, uh, really the the Powhatan Empire, which is a very large area here controlled by uh, by the by Chief Powhatan. Uh, he wanted to pursue trade uh, with these people, so therefore he kept them alive, um, and he was quite sure that um, that in the event that he withdrew his protection uh, as well as uh, his uh, his benevolence in feeding these people who had no idea how to feed themselves or farm um, in the in the new world here in their colony of Virginia, uh, that they would die immediately. So they would be very beholden to him uh, in, in the sense that they were absolutely reliant uh, on uh, the Native Americans for their source of food. So this is ultimately why a vastly larger uh, Native American uh, uh, tribal group allowed uh, these settlers to continue to stay in the colony of Virginia. Um, So the Virginians, after several decades of eking out an existence, shared many of their diseases with the Native Americans who had not had a lot of contact with Westerners, and this caused a rampant and widespread disease uh, in in uh, among the the natives, as well as the animals that the colonists imported from Europe, such as uh, pigs and cattle and goats, which were not native to the area, um, destroyed much of the the crops and landscape that were used by Native Americans for farming. 
So between, uh, and th this of course uh, caused them to have to withdraw some from the area. Um, it caused them to lose many of their own crops. Um, and but the a combination of disease and and uh, destruct the destruction of the habitat uh, in, uh, did not uh, therefore allow the the uh, the Powhatan tribes uh, to make a, an uh, an attack or, or that they chose not to make an attack upon this colony. So let us turn to sort of the commercial success here of the colony of Virginia. So what ultimately was the most successful crop? So there were attempts to grow various uh, uh, cash crops, things that were going to be profitable. But ultimately, the only thing that was worth growing in, in, a, in a profitable sense that you were going to uh, grow this as a cash crop was tobacco, which is imported uh, from, the, uh, from the Caribbean Isles there, the West Indies. Uh, and tobacco even... Um, it was profitable, but it was nowhere near as profitable as sugar. It is only one tenth of the value um, as of as, uh, as sugar. But nevertheless, it it in Virginia, the planters there began to grow these crops. They began to grow uh, tobacco, and it begins to turn some some profit for them. And uh, this is uh, this is successful because before this, there had been absolutely zero profits uh, from this colony, and it was a, a an enormous drain on on uh, on the proprietors and, and the Virginia Company. Um, and there there had to be uh, simply a, a large amount of reforms that were done to this uh, this colony. And rather than the um, Virginia Company doing this, there came to be uh, an investigation of what you know. Why are we seeing uh, fifty percent of the people die here in these colonies year after year after year? Um, well. That was unacceptable in England, and therefore uh, the, the Crown investigates this. And they actually take, they withdraw the charter uh, from, um, from the Virginia Company, and Virginia becomes a Crown-managed colony. Now, this doesn't probably mean what you think it means. It's not as if the Crown is directly uh, involved in, in, uh, in running this thing, um, in, the, in a sense that they are going to closely manage this, uh, but simply um, that they are going to institute some new reforms here and they are going to get all of the money uh, from these things. Now, instead of the proprietors or the, or the joint stock company getting the money, any profits that come from Virginia will, of course, go back to the crown and not to the proprietors. Um, and one of the, the main reforms that took place here is that there was a new style of land grant that was in, in, uh, installed called the head right system. So the head of a family um, would get 50 acres, and it could be as much as 1,000 in some cases, um, but uh, largely uh, it's about a 50-acre grant per head of family. And it was 100 acres if you already lived in the area. Uh, but this was where you could have a personal stake of land because all wealth in the ancient world or in, in, uh, in the pre-modern world is based upon land. So you personally are going to be, be able to become a yeoman by immigrating from England to the colony of Virginia. And you're going to get at least 50 acres uh, for coming into this world and set yourself up uh, a farm and that you would be able to to uh, to generate a nice living from this and this was after you know a generation or two um, your family would would uh, would be able to move up the social uh, uh, the social scale um, and also with this there's going to be transportation so people who were uh, prisoners uh, people who were uh, criminals in England would be sent over to the colonies and and uh, Basically, they were used as a dumping ground in some cases. Um, but uh, there, there was this enormous problem of sustaining the population, and the Crown uh, decides to fix this by 
uh, sending over its uh, its criminal classes into this new system and giving them some land, uh, supposing that this might make them um, better citizens. But it would also uh, help to sustain the European population in the, the harsh realities of this new uh, this new world. So as the colonies develop, there comes to be a change in social status that uh, it goes from everyone having to work um, to ones of these people who call themselves planters and they are uh, sort of the social elite who are tobacco farmers and they were were able to sort of live the life of a, a country gentleman um, as they had acquired a, a, a large amounts of land and that they would then sponsor people to come over and work who were indentured servants. So it might be uh, someone who wanted to come over and work uh, who could not afford their passage because if, if, we, if we go back here, this head right system, you're going to get 50 acres, but you have to pay for your passage to the new world. Now, if you will agree to be an indentured servant for, and work for or, uh, seven years uh, for a planter, then the planter will pay for your passage to come over, but you have to work, of course, for the planter for free. And you also have to grow your own food and all these sorts of things. Uh, but after that seven-year period is over, you can uh, petition and get some land of your own and set yourself up as a, as a farmer there in, uh, in Virginia. So while it will take you seven years it it will uh, it may be worth your time if you survive because of course mortality rates are quite high but nevertheless um, as land becomes really hard to acquire and you have to begin giving land as, as more and more people come and more people become indentured servants uh, the the uh, indenturehood uh, changes in times uh, and it becomes longer in some cases up to 12 years and, uh, and then who is counting the years? How is this enforced? Um, all of this is up for debate and it causes problems. And also uh, the planters don't really like that uh, there all this competition for land among uh, new settlers who come in. So it becomes easier and more profitable, cheaper, um, to simply purchase slaves to work on these tobacco farms. And really we began to see around the 1670s the um the introduction of slavery on a large scale in virginia <coughs> so here you can see um a, a an advertisement here <coughs> excuse me <coughs> for uh someone being transported to the new world and yes, sometimes there were people who the planters would just uh, simply uh, pay for, but in some cases there were um, an agreement among the planter to sort of pay a uh, uh, you know a debt or a prison sentence or or something of that nature. And this is how the contracts get changed. Um, that uh, you know if you had a large debt that had to be paid off, or you were in debtor's prison in England, and the planter pays for this, well, you're period of service has to change. Um, so we, we see a, a difference here between um, slavery uh, and, and indentured servanthood, um, but there are certain rights that you have, even if you are an indentured servant, um, that you don't have as a slave. Um, and, and there's also the problem of escape. So once someone gets to the new world, they may just simply decide to, uh, to abscond and not honor their contract. And it's very difficult um, to find this person among uh, other Europeans, other English people. Um, whereas that was not the problem um, with, uh, with African slaves because they are immediately recognizable because of the color of their skin. So um, it, there, this is an, uh, another motivation for the planters to adopt slavery is because it was, it was, uh, there was a mark, uh, of course, that you could see that, okay, well, this person is a slave and therefore um, uh, they're easily identifiable in the system and it makes it much, much harder to, to escape uh, because of the uh, ethnicity of the, of the slave. And uh, 
I would just also note here, and we've talked about most of these things, um, that the reason slavery was adopted is, yes, it was because the, you could um, much more easily identify someone as, as your laborer on your farm, um, but also it just simply became much more profitable to purchase a slave rather than sponsor a large number of, um, of immigrants because when the immigrant is eventually going to leave and the immigrant's family is not always bound, although there's some negotiations about whether the, the indentured servant's family also has to serve and, and, and there's, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all to this, um, but the slave... If the slave becomes married, uh, or if the slave has children, whatever it is, this these are your property, and it is uh, perpetuating, it is self-perpetuating, um, and and therefore uh, it it just simply makes a lot more sense economically, although it's morally reprehensible and awful um, uh, institution. But nevertheless, from an economic perspective, um, it makes much more sense to begin to use uh, slaves instead of uh, indentured servants. And you can see here sort of the social mobility um, scale here for the, uh, the, the uh, colony of Virginia. You can see as one would start an indentured servant, you would become free labor, you would eventually own your own land, and eventually you yourself might actually become a planter. You would become a tobacco grower, and then you could import more labor from England or purchase slaves. Um, and this system of indentured servanthood and this, this uh, sort of belief in, in uh, the social mobility cycle ends because of land value. As more and more people show up and um, as the population grows, as the, the big planters begin to acquire more and more land from small landholders, um, land becomes extremely difficult to obtain and it also becomes very expensive to purchase. Um, so therefore, uh, we see the failure of this model and the introduction of slavery. And one of the effects of this, of land holdings in, in large numbers, or uh, the, the, uh, the planters acquiring much of the land and therefore the, the availability of land is uh, of Nathaniel Bacon's uh, Great Rebellion. And this was a, a reaction by groups of, or landless, effectively a landless mob or a landless group of, of people who could not acquire what they wanted. Uh, and they wanted to um, take this from Native Americans. They, if they took this from Native Americans, that there would be a, uh, an Indian war. Um, and eventually there was uh, a, a, a react or a... a uh, a full-scale rebellion by these people, which we call uh, Bacon's Rebellion. Um, and this was, to some degree, I don't want to say it's a, it was an entirely a class war, but um, it was certainly a reaction by a landless group of people against the more wealthy groups of planters um, who saw their ability to rise in social status and to acquire land and become yeomen and gentlemen um, and, and, uh, and do the same thing that the planters had done. Um, it was absolutely a reaction uh, against this. And, uh, and it shows uh, that there is great social upheaval here by uh, groups, uh, by, the, by the colonists, uh, quite early on in, in, uh, in the colony's history in, in the uh, 1670s. Um, and, of course, we began to see uh, this, this shift to slavery, and the fear of this landless mob of people uh, fuels this, and it encourages this even more. So uh, Bacon's Rebellion uh, does not have the effect that uh, the, the rebels had hoped um, that it would, but rather um, it, it pushes planters and, the, uh, and, and uh, proprietors to encourage slavery even more because you could deal with slaves much more harshly um, than you could um, 
the workforce. And also at the end of the day, then, again, the slave is going to remain on the farm. Uh, the, the slave is going to uh, be there for forever because it is, uh, the slave is property uh, in, the, in a way that once the indentured servant leaves the farm, it can then turn into a group of, of rebels, much like Bacon's uh, uh, rebels. Now, we just uh, need to discuss slavery here for just a, a moment in, in the colonies, but uh, I had uh, spoke about this in my last lecture and about the, the dreaded uh, mis, uh, uh, middle passage and the triangular trade of uh, the slave trade. But uh, slaves were imported into the New World um, as, as early as 1500, uh, and we see uh, very large numbers of slaves coming into the New World uh, and, and uh, not just in, among the British colonies and in uh, the, the places that will become the United States, but we see large, large, the vast, no, the most uh, numbers of slaves are going to be uh, imported into uh, the, the, uh, the Sugar Isles, into the Caribbean. And you can see here in the British uh, West Indies, the French West Indies, uh, the Spanish Caribbean islands, and then in South America here. So you can see the vast, vast numbers pale in comparison to what uh, the, uh, the number of slaves that were imported into uh, the, the North American colonies. So less than half a million into, were, were uh, imported by 1810 uh, when the slave trade ends. Um, but uh, we see many, many more uh, slaves imported into the Sugar Isles because this is where it is, of course, the most profitable institution. But ultimately, this uh, most awful and vile institution of slavery, more than uh, 7.6 million human beings were sold into slavery uh, for uh, agricultural production in the New World during the time of colonization and early imperialism. And especially in the United States, um, I had mentioned that it, uh, the ethnicity of the slave, of an African slave, makes them easily identifiable. Um, so this perpetuates racism, uh, especially in, uh, the, in the North American colonies, because uh, slave, slavery was identified based upon a particular race. Now, slavery has been around as uh, the, the most terrible institution uh, from the dawn of time and since uh, time immemorial in history. Um, it had not been ever really based upon ethnicity. Slav, the word for slave itself, comes from uh, the, the uh, Eastern European uh, group of people who would have had, of course, uh, Caucasian, or would be Caucasian in ethnicity. Um, but as, uh, as the slave trade develops in Africa it, around uh, the year in the, the mid-1400s uh, and 1500s, um, it, it, uh, it takes on a racial uh, and uh, an ethnic element, um, especially in North America, because of uh, these are the only uh, uh, group, uh, ethnic group of people who are being imported uh, into uh, this region that we, we only see Africans being brought in. So therefore, this, uh, the, the greatest legacy uh, of this slave trade is going to be, of course, to perpetuate a system of, of racism based upon uh, African ethnicity. Now, along with that, um, these slaves bring their own culture, of course. So many of the foods uh, that we still enjoy to this day, things like barbecue were brought in uh, by slaves uh, from, from uh, the Caribbean Isles uh, and uh, into uh, North America from, uh, from that. And there's some debate about uh, you know, where the origins of barbecue are, uh, but uh, whether it was something that was learned in, in, the, uh, in the West Indies or whether it was something that was brought uh, all the way from Africa, the smoking of meats and these kinds of things. Uh, but nevertheless, we see uh, them bringing their own religions. Uh, so we see uh, what we would now call voodoo uh, practices, sort of these these uh, these West African forms of spiritualism and and, uh, and religion that are brought into uh, the Caribbean and then subsequently North America. Um, but also foods, uh, uh, styles of uh, of dress, uh, uh, songs, these sorts of things. Uh, so this brings a, a new kind of culture, and it adds uh, uh, an important layer of uh, of culture within the, this uh, early period of colonization. 
But ultimately, the whole reason for indentured servitude or slavery is to, uh, is to perpetuate wealth. To create and perpetuate wealth. And this is going to be based upon agricultural trade. And trade, of course, is just simply the art of buying and, and, uh, and selling, or the work of buying and selling. And the more that you trade back and forth, uh, it is going to create uh, more wealth, typically. And this is, is uh, not a free trade styled system, a capitalistic system like what we uh, have today. But this is going to be a mercantilist uh, economy. And trade is going to be based upon luxury items. That this is not yet a world in the 1600s that is one um, that has vast items that are traded for all people. But this is a luxury good trade. Sugar, tobacco... These are crops that are consumed by the upper echelon of society. Peppers, spices, uh, nice things, silks uh, from uh, the, the Far East. This is something that the, the wealthy are going to be consuming and buying. It's not something that everybody is doing, though everyone would, would love to have sugar, and they do sometimes get these sorts of things. Um, but it is a luxury goods trade. This is not yet a sort of consumption economy where everybody is buying lots of things because industrialization hasn't happened and they can't be made cheaply enough. Sugar is an enormously expensive crop uh, to make, and so therefore it, uh, it can only be consumed by um, the, the, uh, the most wealthy among the, the social classes. So... Trade networks have existed for thousands of years. And, of course, it all originates in China and the Far East. So uh, the Silk Road develops as a major trade route uh, between China and, uh, and all the way into Western Europe. Um, and throughout the Middle Ages, we see vast trading networks uh, developing uh, in, in uh, these regions of the world. Uh, from all across uh, the, the uh, Central Asian steppes into uh, the Middle East and then from uh, the Middle East where Muslim merchants would trade with the Italians and the Italians would trade with, uh, with Western Europeans. And this is the reason, of course, that we talked about in our Age of Exploration that those in uh, Portugal, Spain, and England, uh, and uh, the Dutch as well and the French, try to find a new way to China is to avoid all of these merchants. They sail around Africa, they sail around uh, the, uh, South America, and they discover the new world. But as they discover the new world, they build new economies. They begin to grow uh, new things and establish new trading networks. And it was based upon a system of what we call mercantilism. This is a pre- capitalistic theory of economics, and it's vastly different than sort of what we uh, conceptualize as, uh, and this is the reason for the building of sort of these, these, uh, these protective tariff-like, uh, or the, these, uh, these uh, protective policies that keep all of your trade in your own imperial sphere uh, of, uh, of influence. So there was a belief in mercantilism that, uh, that there is a finite supply of bullion in the world. And the rich people in the world are the ones who have the most gold and silver. So it was Europeans looked at other societies. They saw, uh, they saw the, uh, the Muslims. They saw uh, Byzantium. They saw uh, the Chinese. They saw uh, Indians. And they all had massive amounts of gold and silver because that's what the Europeans had to trade them. So their, therefore their economic belief was that, well, there can be added a little bit to the gold and silver supply of the world, but ultimately there is a finite amount of money. So there is, uh, there is it cannot be added as we add uh, to our money supply all the time, um, but rather it is a fixed supply of, of, uh, of money. And therefore... If you had a favorable balance of trade, that uh, more goods have to come into your nation or your kingdom than you are trading out, 
Uh, if, if you do not have a favorable balance of trade, then you will become poorer and who you're trading with will become richer. Now, this is not necessarily the case. Um, you can, of course, trade many more things uh, or you can trade more to one place and it's actually more profitable uh, for you. Uh, it's because other places have ways of making things cheaper and better and more quickly, more efficiently than, than uh, country A. So if you, uh, instead of making computer chips in the United States, um, you, uh, you parcel that out to, uh, you know, uh, to, to China instead, that it is vastly, vastly cheaper for you to do that um, than it is uh, to make them yourself. Um, so, but they didn't recognize this at the time. Uh, mercantilism is based simply upon you acquiring a favorable balance of trade. So you always have to uh, keep more, uh, you have to, to trade more or export more than you import. And also you have to keep as much of this gold and silver in your own nation as possible. So therefore, the colonies of the world, or when, uh, when Europeans began to create colonies, they, uh, the, the, the English, for instance, they established this thing they called the Navigation Acts. Uh, the Navigation Acts are something uh, that was uh, in the 16, uh, let's see, I believe it's the 1650s, uh, uh, that are established in order, no, it's the 1660s, uh, established to keep all uh, all goods made in the colonies on British shipping. So you could not uh, you could not put uh, goods on Dutch ships. You could not put goods on French ships. You had to ship everything on British ships that, that came back to England, and from there it could be exported uh, to to other places. Now, of course, other nations are not going to agree to this. Uh, this unfavorable balance of trade. So they're going to tariff things. They're going, and, and uh, so therefore, this becomes an insular system that is protectionist uh, with each nation, of course, uh, battling against each other nation, but also the need to create empire in order to survive. So therefore, it becomes essential to acquire more and more colonies in order to produce more and more goods uh, and, and, uh, and to keep this in your own imperial system. And if you did not expand, um, then you would uh, you would be relegated to uh, not having a favorable balance of trade and having a very small economy. So this is sort of how um, how the thinking of the time um, went on economics. So now let us turn to proprietary colonies. I want to look at uh, just the composition of uh, some of the North American colonies quickly, and we'll, we'll finish up here. So uh, proprietary colonies are those who are founded, of course, by a proprietor or someone who basically gets a feudal land grant or a group of people who gets a feudal land grant from the crown, uh, and they are able to establish a, uh, a colony in a particular area. So these are all the proprietary colonies of the United States or the, that will become the United States. There is also this, uh, then a geographical um, division of, of colonies, uh, and you have the southern colonies, the mid colonies, and uh, the New England colonies. So here you will see the defined as southern colonies here of Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Now, I'm just going to look at a few of these. Uh, Maryland was founded, uh, of course, for, uh, to, to make money because the proprietor wants to make money, but this is, it was founded by, uh, the, uh, by uh, the second Lord Baltimore, uh, Cecil uh, Calvert. Uh, and he, wants, uh, he not only wants to make money, but of course he wants to create a, um, uh, a Catholic haven in, for a colony where Catholics who were persecuted um, in England by the Puritans uh, where they can go and live uh, and practice their religion in peace. Um, and, and therefore, uh, the, uh, the Catholics will, will found uh, Maryland, uh, named after, of course, the, the Blessed Virgin uh, Mary. And uh, much like in Virginia, they will uh, create an economy uh, based upon tobacco, a cash crop uh, economy, and it ultimately becomes uh, relatively successful. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, the Lord uh, Baltimore makes, uh, makes a handsome profit off of his investments. We also see uh, the, the Carolinas uh, developing shortly after uh, that of, of Maryland. 
and um, the main crops here are not uh, going to be um, tobacco but it's going to be rice rice is the big they, though they do grow tobacco please don't get me wrong um, tobacco is an important um, an important cash crop for the Carolinas um, but really rice is going to be what is um, the the uh, the key here in growing and making money in uh, in the Carolinas and there, this uh, the Carolinas are, are founded by a group of proprietors here, not just a single individual, but eight proprietors. And we begin to see a uh, a period of wars between uh, the Dutch um, and the English, and it, this will uh, conclude. And I talked about this in a previous lecture, but uh, the Anglo-Dutch Wars, a series of of three wars, ultimately concluding with the Treaty of Westminster, and where all of the Dutch colonies, including those of New York, and which was New Amsterdam, would be renamed New York, um, would uh, would come over to the English. So not only would the English then have uh, the colony of Virginia as well as the Puritan colonies, but they would acquire these these uh, very much uh, this large area of land uh, that was Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. New York itself uh, is uh, it has the best deep water port right at the headwaters of uh, of the Hudson, um, as well as uh, having many uh, advantages in in uh, in natural resources, including uh, lumber as, or you know timber as being uh, an enormous first exporter from New York, um, as well as being a key in in the key location being right on the Hudson River, so you have access to all of upstate uh, New York and on into to Lake Champlain uh, and uh, uh, beyond um, but here is, is a really a key location for a trading post so this is why New York uh, really develops us from uh, being the nexus of trade on the Hudson River Valley Pennsylvania is a sort of a, a unique colony um, but it um, it is founded again for religious purposes uh, and it is founded by William Penn, who is a Quaker. And Quakers are are famously unpopular uh, in England. They refuse to take off their hats uh, to their social superiors. Um, they refuse to uh, to obey uh, laws. Uh, they they uh, and they are pacifists. That they, they they would uh, they would not fight no matter what. Um, and therefore, uh, this, this sort of curious organization of of, uh, of Quakers and the Quaker meeting uh, that uh, they believed in the doctrine of the inner light that the Bible had no I mean it was a, as a nice uh, governing document but ultimately the inner light of the revelation to each believer um, was what was was uh, important and that is what guided them um, and therefore uh, if God gave an individual a particular revelation um, that then they would um, they could they could overrule scripture. They could overrule the traditions of the church. Uh, there was no formal priesthood. There was the Quaker meeting where uh, where things were not done by vote, um, but rather by consensus. And this is how they wanted to set up their colony. At least uh, William Penn wanted to set this up. Um, but uh, the the colonists demand from Penn uh, a a constitution uh, or a, a a charter. They want a charter. Um, and uh, and therefore he is forced to to do this because they just simply could not uh, do uh, do the administration of their colony based upon uh, a the model of a Quaker meeting. So Pennsylvania uh, quickly uh, becomes a area of r much uh, religious toleration because of the pacifism of uh, of the Quakers, and uh, their, their economics were largely based upon fur trade and timber. So Georgia is kind of a curious colony, and it was set up by a single proprietor, a general, a James Oglethorpe. And Oglethorpe wanted to sort of create uh, a, an asylum for the poor and the downtrodden, that he wanted to be a great philanthropist, and he wanted to, uh, or a philanthropist, and he wanted to, um, to create an area where the, the poor, the the uh, the criminal class of England could be be taken to, and that they would reform themselves after getting grants of land, uh, and uh, that Oglethorpe and his uh, his uh, advisors would set over this colony as sort of a uh, 
uh, a, full, a philanthropic board, uh, and that they would uh, they would ask they would pay for the passage of colonists to Georgia, um, and uh, and that they would rehabilitate these people. And of course, that there was distinctions between uh, the deserving poor um, as and uh, the undeserving poor. You know, if you had uh, you had fallen into to crime and and uh, uh, you you were not a good uh, type of person, they might not accept you. Uh, and of course, part of this colony's uh, uh, um, makeup was that they banned all kinds of uh, uh, of spirits that you could not have whiskey or or rum because they believed that these uh, would uh, destroy uh, the moral fiber of uh, the individuals, the poor who were trying to be rehabilitated here. Uh, and uh, slavery also was prohibited uh, initially in Georgia. And finally, here, if we look down to the south, uh, this is Spanish Florida. And one another main reason for the, the development of the colony of Georgia was, uh, was a sort of to be a bulwark against the Spanish uh, advancing north. That uh, the, the, uh, the Georgia colony was, was a protective means to, to sort of be uh, a buffer between the Carolinas uh, and the the northern colonies of of the English and their uh, their eternal enemy the the Spanish in uh, in Florida. So there we have it. Uh, the uh, we will conclude this lecture on uh, the makeup of the colonies and their their many proprietors and and uh, developments in in the New World. So we have seen uh, all the way from sort of these uh, uh, adventuring types like Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, to proprietary colonies, to royal the development of royal colonies, and we will see uh, the the eventual control of most colonies, and they will all be put under uh, the the uh, governance of of royal uh, officials eventually, uh, and we will see the development from this privatized system of colonies to one of 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 much more an imperial model designed to keep wealth within the British sphere of influence, which will become the British Empire. Colonies will be essential means of providing raw goods that will be manufactured in Great Britain and then they will enrich uh, eventually uh, England. So thank you for watching, and I, uh, I hope that you have learned something of colonies.